Hello, chess kids. Mike Amori. That's right. I said chess kids because this game you're looking at uh, was actually played on chesskid.com. I moved it over into my computer, set up the pieces like you see them, and I want to show it to you. Now, um, this game was has been stopped after move 12. So this fits right in with what we did in class today in 12 o'clock and 2 o'clock where we were taking a look at your work after, you know, anywhere between 10 and 12 moves. The idea of the exercise was to see just how set up you are for the middle game. Because in most chess games, my dear friends, after 12 moves, you're pretty much going to have the minor pieces developed, have an idea of where the kings live, and the basic plans for going forward. But if you look at this position, this is kind of interesting because um, neither player has castled and black is up a pawn. And I chose this game from chesskid.com not only because um, it fit in with what we were doing, but it was really well played. There was some nice um, tactics and some very instructive mistakes that were played in this game. So our player, is actually, his actual name is Andrew, but his chess kid name is Gigantic Irony, uh, is playing Professional Kindle. Oh boy. Um, so after 12 moves, we get this position with the two bishops for black against the two knights. White is down upon. All right, let's see how these birds got there. E4, E5, no explanation needed. Knight F3, knight C6, bishop C4, knight F6. This is the two knights defense. If you're going to play this move, you need to have an answer to knight G5. You have to know how to protect this F pawn. If you play knight F6 and don't know how to handle this pawn, you're going to get creamed. So most of you would play the move D5 here. But that didn't happen to Andrew because after he played knight F6, white played D3. And so far, check marks for everyone. Every move now, bishop C5, bishop G5, pawn H6, not a wasted pawn move. Every one of these moves the players are following the opening principles that you all know, okay? Pawn to d6. Luca, don't pull your sister's hair. Second time, pawn to d6, opening up the light squared bishop. Pawn h3. Why did white play h3? To prevent this bishop from pinning the knight to the queen. You've seen these ideas so many times. And now a pretty interesting move uh, by black that I like a lot. Black wants to make the game a little unbalanced. And what do I mean by that? Meaning like maybe you give your opponent two knights and have two bishops. So you have the same amount of points, but you have different kinds of pieces. They're not balanced. Or maybe you change the pawn structure so that it's different. Another way to unbalance a position is to castle on different sides of the board. All of these little changes in the position create interesting ways to play. Let me show you what I mean. He played knight a5. He put the knight on the side of the board. And the knight is put on the side of the board simply to go after this light squared bishop, to trade this knight for this bishop. And if that can be accomplished, then you'll see that black has two bishops versus two knights and maybe they can use the two bishops to open up the game and overpower the knights. The person with the knights is obviously going to keep that game closed or put the knights on really good squares to fight the bishops. It's pretty simple stuff. So knight a5. Here white makes a little bit of a mistake and plays pawn to c3. And I say little mistake because... It allows in this position knight takes c4. Now, white is going to recapture the knight, and they have two ways to recapture it. Do you see them both? You can be like, Mike, has it been a long day for you? There's only one way to take back the knight. No, there's not. Never forget to look at every check and capture. As a matter of fact, white probably should have played the move queen to a4 check and however you get out of check you know you can play a move like bishop to d7 then the queen can take the knight on c4 keeping the pawn structure intact um 
black has to be uh, aware that there's always the possibility of g5 uh, chasing that bishop. Watch that pawn jump. Come back. There we go. Uh, which is something white could play. But at least all of these pawns are kind of neat and the e pawn is protected. Watch how the game continued, however. So after c3, just moving the pawn, trying to build a big center, Andrew took the knight, but white took back with the pawn. Okay, how does that affect things? Well, when you take with the pawn, it leaves this pawn undefended. You see the problem? So when these pawns got doubled, Andrew said, wow, I can just take that pawn. But you can't do it now because you'll lose your queen. So he decided to push his G pawn to G5, kick the bishop, and then take the pawn with his knight. Now look, when he plays these two moves, and this is why I'm showing you the game, black has to be careful here. If I back it up to this position, if you're going to play G5 with black, and your king is still in the middle of the board, you have to have a concrete reason. So in this position, Andrew is chasing the bishop away to win a center pawn. By doing so, the e-file is gonna open slightly, but here black can get away with it because he has this pawn chain already built. So even if a rook comes to this line, like if you can imagine this in your head, g5, this is the game continuation, Bishop to g3, knight takes pawn. You guys see the position on the board? Okay, let's take it before g5. I want you to try to picture the same position. So the black knight just took here. You can get away with it because if black, if white castles and then puts a rook or a queen on this line, there's no pin because you have this beautiful pawn chain already set up. So the black king is gonna be secure. So Andrew had to see that before just throwing the black pawn up the board. Because what some of you did in your games today, the WCA, is you threw those pawns up the board and your king was not secure. So I hope you can, or agree with me, that this is a reasonable time for black to play a little bit risky. Black is better here. They're, they're definitely doing better in this position. Now, the knight is attacking the bishop, and <clears throat> white really can't do much about it because the f-pawn is being attacked twice. You can't move the bishop away. Um, so you need to take care of that, uh, that f-pawn. Um, would you think castling works? I just castled the white king here. Uh, is that a good way to protect the f-pawn? No, that's a really bad way because when the knight takes the bishop, oh, sorry, when the knight takes the bishop, can the f-pawn take back? No, there's a pin, and white just loses a piece. That's really bad news, okay? You see the tactics? They never stop. Always keep an eye for every check and capture. So let's go back. There's g5, kicking the bishop. Andrew snaps the pawn, and white realizes they can't castle, so they just develop a piece. And Andrew rightly makes another trade. So again, he's breaking a rule. He's not developing his last piece. He's moving the knight again to take a piece. And he's trading not just because he's up the pawn, but because he's permanently weakening all of these pawns. I mean, look at all these pawn weaknesses. And this bishop, along with this bishop, look at the two bishops here. They're long-range pieces, right? They're, they really have a strong influence on the rest of this game. So black is playing really, really well. He plays queen to e7, possibly getting ready to castle queenside, putting a uh, queen behind the pawn, getting ready to push the pawn, and then black gets hit with pawn a4. And now you have to be a little bit careful that this bishop doesn't get trapped with the move b4. And there were some other possibilities. Maybe black could have just pushed the pawn and bothered the knight. But I like Andrew's move. He just plays pawn a5 and stops white from really bothering anybody. He comes after him with the knight. Again, not castling the king. Well, here you can't really castle, right? Because, because of this bishop. So now the game is taking on a very interesting character. 
Knight comes to the middle of the board, and Andrew wants to preserve the bishop. He pulls it back. Pawn to b4, and the problem for white here is they're beginning to open up lines with their king still in the middle. And I like Andrew's move a lot. He breaks another rule. Instead of just developing this bishop, he says, you know what? My king is safe enough in the center. Yours is not. And he attacks the knight on e4 with the move f5. You guys see how powerful? Look at that pawn storm. It's like 700 pawns marching up the board. This poor knight's getting kicked all over the place. So the knight drops back to f2, and Andrew plows forward with another pawn. If you saw Fun Master Mike's videos on chesskid.com, he calls the pawn duo like a snow plow. So if I go back to this position, you see these two pawns? This, this connection, actually, it's like five pawns together, but white is just getting kicked all over the board. So the knight jumps into d4, and here Andrew takes a pawn and gets hit with queen h5 check. And here he, he has this winning position. Black is just all over white here. Um, perhaps he, he should have put the king on d8, not f8, although f8 is just fine. Because after f8, white castles, and by castling, puts his king on the same line with this rook. Uh, I mean, it's over here. Black has just took another pawn, but you have to watch out because there's always the chance for a tactic when your king lines up. So knight comes into b5, white trying to get active, but by playing knight to b5, he opens up this diagonal to the... Um, the knight here, there's a nasty pin, and black should really just push the pawn. And now the game's completely over. After e3, um, if the knight doesn't move, you take a piece. You can't pin the pawn because we can always take the knight with check, and white is getting crushed. And here, Andrew starts to just small chances. He develops his bishop on e6 instead of playing pawn e3. So he plays bishop to e6, missing the opportunity to push the pawn, although he's still winning. Queen goes to e2, and now bishop a5, which was a mistake. From having a huge advantage, his advantage starts to shrink. So he puts the bishop on a5 to defend the pawn from the knight, but by doing so, remember what I said before? You guys remember this line here? Look at that. And if white takes this pawn on e4, all of a sudden you get a pawn back. Black is still much better, but hey, you, you know, you never know. White may creep back in the game, but unfortunately for white, and fortunately for our hero, he missed it and instead put the knight on d1 and uh, just doesn't have the opportunity anymore. So queen goes to f7. And again, you know, maybe not the greatest sequence. He really should have pushed that pawn earlier. Queen to e3, and game over. Okay, let's go back. If the knight comes to e3 and blockades the square, hey, this is a fast game, 15 minutes, anything can happen. But as soon as you put the queen on that square, let's go back. What do you notice? The queen is lined up with who? That's right. Bishop to b6, game over. I'm going to end it here, okay? Um, really good game. So we'll do this every week. We'll take a look at either one of your tournament games or something from chesskid.com and, and show the group. In the meanwhile, you make sure you folks are playing online and using uh, uh, those tactics, okay? I'll see you next week.